Hello, everybody. Welcome to Link Live. My name is Marina Mayer, editor in chief of Fluid Logistics and supply and demand chain executive. Just the two of us today. That's oh, sorry. Hi. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Brielle, first. <laughs> I know, I know. Brielle, Brielle Jekyll, our associate editor, she's on vacation, lucky her. And we are coming off the hill, the heels of our SDN summit, which was yesterday, um, discussing um, navigating business amid the coronavirus. And man, were these topics good, these speakers were good, and the content was fantastic. So we're gonna kind of take a little time today to just kind of rehash some of the things that we learned. Um, the on-demand version for those of you that registered but were not able to attend live, that will be posted within the next 24, 48 hours to foodlogistics.com and sgcexec.com. For those who have not registered and are still interested, you can still register for the on-demand version as well. And we have our next one coming up August 25th. And that's discussing the state of the supply chain industry. So very excited. So let's talk. So um, it's, it kicked off with Edward Siegel, who is a, is a crisis management expert. And he just, the stuff that he said just blew me away because he talked about not just the pandemic, but he talked about crisis in terms of natural disasters, in terms of things that just happen you know, whether it be workplace shootings or whether it be, um, you know, the weather related or just anything that goes on with the crisis. And I just, and how things are geography based and, and it just, he, he just blew me away. And I kind of, what kind of things did you take away from his? Just that everyone should have a pandemic plan in place now or just like any sort of crisis management plan. And not only should you have one in place, but it needs to be written down just so that people can see it because like just think about your first job so my first job was at a retail store and everywhere in the back room we had these laid out plans for like what happens if there's a severe thunderstorm or a tornado because I live in Wisconsin we have just like all this mess of a weather and you don't think about how important that is even for like fires you need to know what to if there's a fire drill I was just thinking the fire drill too so yeah and so just having a written down plan is really mm -hmm. important and even I don't know if you can do this but you could say like what you did wrong the first time and now know what to do right this ne the next time around god forbid there's not a next time right yeah, no, that's a good point because he did say, you know, obviously write it down, but then he said, you know, get everybody involved that needs to be involved and, and up to date. And, you know, one of the questions we asked him was, you know, how often should you update your crisis management plan? And he said a pre-COVID time, it would be once a year. During COVID, he said at least once a quarter, because as we all know, with the pandemic, like what's going on, is things are constantly changing. You know, a natural disaster comes in, wipes you out. Okay, you have time to rebuild. This is just an ongoing thing that continues to evolve and grow many different layers to it. I also thought it was interesting. We did a poll on the, this, uh, the attendees. 48%, so a little less than half of the attendees do not have a written crisis management plan in place. And I just was so surprised, I think, because everybody now, you know, especially people we talk to, they're all about risk management. Mm -hmm. and I don't know. I just was really surprised by that. It stressed me out. <laughs> it <laughs> stressed me out for the lack of crisis management. <laughs> the lack of the crisis management, because obviously no one could have predicted this, or nobody could have predicted the severity of this and how long it's going on. Because, like, you look at other countries, you, for the UK, for example, everything is slowly going back to normal there. And so it was just, it blew my mind. It blew my mind. Yeah, I was, I was very surprised. And in those crisis management plans, you know, they talked about, you know, it's not just the overall how to protect your company. It's things like vendor management. How do you protect yourself if a vendor um, goes under or gets affected? What if their workers get impacted or get sick? Um, it talked about labor issues, just basic supplier sourcing, which has always been an issue. 
whether you're in food or pharma or whatever the case is, um, and just having the notification plan in place. So I don't know that if I had to take anything away from that, it was just that the industry is is prepared to an extent, but when it comes to you know being proactive about um, pandemics and future things that are coming ahead, you know everybody I think has kind of tunnel vision. You know, it's just let's deal with this now, and then we'll deal with that later. Well, yeah. here we are in later. So. And then something else he said too is don't let it consume you. Don't let all like the news about coronavirus con- consume you, but don't be ignorant about it because at the end of the day, companies are responsible for keeping their employees and their operations safe. And you can't do that if you just live as like an ignorance is bliss situation, mm-hmm. not say it informed but I remember at the beginning of the pandemic when we were all scared and we right that and our editorial team would talk constantly about how we were having COVID cries and just like yeah how scary it was and I remember just feeling so consumed and so helpless about the state of the world that I logged out of everything for a while and that helps like your mental health it helps your mm-hmm. overall well-being but then I would still stay informed because we're journalists at the end of the day that's our job is to be informed and hold people accountable right and I think that was a really good piece of advice that a lot of people aren't telling each other I think that's a good point because I think we all allow ourselves to be consumed because it is the reality of the situation but I mean yeah it is good you know at the end of the day companies are still doing very positive things they're still doing mm-hmm. great things that we're probably we're going to do regardless if there was a pandemic or not and so I know we have all internally as an editorial team have been very conscientious about balancing you know, we still want to cover COVID, but like, we still want to cover all the other things that these companies are doing because they're in the trenches day to day and they're the ones doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's a very good point you brought up to, to not be so consumed by, you know, everything. You just kind of need a mm-hmm. mental, a mental break. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm going through my notes really quick. And then our second session was with Chris Sachuk from the Hackett Group, and he was talking about, you know, a procurement's perspective on, you know, how companies can insulate from the effects of instability. And his his presentation, I don't know if you remember from the chat, you know, because on these these summits, all the attendees when they log in, they can go and chat with each other. And I think a couple of our uh, attendees actually kind of connected via LinkedIn offsite so that they could work out some of their issues together, which I thought was great. That's such a great networking opportunity and that's exactly what this is about. Um, But we had a lot of great feedback about Chris's, um, his presentation because it was so informative. He was talking about, you know, here's something that I thought was totally crazy. He said, as we were exiting 2019, so last year, there was already increasing concern among the supply chain industry about a recession happening. And this is before the pandemic was even on anybody's radars. So I thought, you know, from a procurement standpoint, that's huge because that means that there were already some loopholes in that process that weren't really being addressed, whether it's nearshoring, offshoring, whether it's import export, whatever the case is. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I thought that was interesting. I agree. I think. The thing that he said that really stood out to me was having a secondary supplier Mm -hmm. because it all started when the virus started to get very serious in China around January or their their New Year holiday. They already shut down the entire country for two weeks. And so companies are able to plan for that. But then when lockdowns extended further than that, that's why they weren't able to get their materials right. at all. And so things were going out of stock faster. And just like, remember at Monix, allegedly a company didn't show up because their booth was shipped from China. Yes. And could- I was just going to say that. Exactly. I was just thinking as you were talking. And so to have a secondary supplier that keeps your business in operations as well. And that's why 
this is all over SCCE. If you go and check back in like March or February, mm-hmm. we have a bunch of articles about getting secondary suppliers and how people are going towards Vietnam and Thailand to start short or to start operating as well. And that I just think that's really important because I don't know, maybe it's because I'm just like a very nervous <laughs> person <laughs> in general that I need options mm-hmm. all the time. Think of it like you're packing for vacation, or at least ladies, when you're packing for vacation. <laughs> <laughs> you, you could always use that extra pair of shoes. Yes, you, you, <laughs> you never know when you option. need it. <laughs> yes, you need to have options. And so that should be a best practice in most businesses. Yeah, no, I agree. Having the backup plan and a plan B and even a plan C to some extent is is definitely worth it. You know, he talked about how, you know, at the beginning of the year, 32% um, of companies that they surveyed, that the Hackett Group surveyed, um, we're in the process of leveraging supplier risk technology, which again, goes back to my previous comment. Like, I think that a lot of, I, I was under the assumption that companies were doing more of that. But now amidst the pandemic, 100% of those respondents that they went back and revisited now plan to implement some kind of technology for risk management. So it's like, that's on everybody's radar right now. And last night I was watching the special in 2020 that talked about you know the coronavirus and kind of like, the behind the scenes stuff on it, you know, like more of the political side of it, but like, it was just, you know, you, you put yourself in that mindset of, okay, where was I in January when China was shut down? Then where was I in February? And then I think back to when we were in Modex and like, that's when things really started to come to light. And we weren't really sure like how concerned we should be and this and that, but people kept talking about, Hey, you know, so-and-so couldn't get over here because they were coming from overseas and they just couldn't make it. And you're just like, Oh, that's too bad, you know? And then you go back home and you're like, wow, this really is a mess. <laughs> I know. I remember because it was declared a global pandemic on like that Tuesday or yes, that we were there and we were all just at our booth all <laughs> around our phones to be like, did you see what's going on in the group? Like, like we just couldn't. And I like, know. We just couldn't believe it. And we're just like, what is going on? And I remember because they we all flew back home that Thursday. And then that Friday was when my kids' schools all shut down. And I was like, okay, this is like for real. <laughs> <laughs> like now I got to figure this out with my kids. <laughs> like now we're talking. But yeah, it's pre-crisis versus post-crisis. Like it's just, it, it really hit home as to how real things were. And, you know, again, we're looking at it from the outside coming in because, you know, we're journalists and we're reporting the news. But, you know, for a lot of these companies, this was this was the real deal, like how to completely mm-hmm. pivot overnight to save people and product and your company and your brand. And, oh, my God, what if I made the wrong mistake? So, yeah, yeah. I think this session stressed and didn't really say this but you have to be proactive instead of reactive yes now and that is something that's usually not common for people like it you think it would be but it's not so just even last year there is a bunch of cybersecurity issues where like big name companies were getting hacked very frequently and i remember i was talking to someone and i said like do you think people will only start to get a risk management plan in place when they see a big name company get hacked. And they said, yes, because the little, like there's money behind it. And so I have the funds for it, but it's so important. Just think, especially now, everybody's vulnerable. Oh, I know. And, and everybody's trying to, you know, think of how much, since everybody's remote, think of how Mm -hmm. much stuff is stored online or, you know, in the cloud, we were talking about the cloud earlier today, I couldn't find a document because it was in the cloud. And I'm like, I don't know where that is on my computer. (laughs) So it's like, you know, think about all the stuff that we're saving, you know, on different parts of our computer and our, and our servers, because we're all remote, you know, we're not pushing papers back and forth. So it's just a totally, like, I was just floored. So I thought Chris did a great job and, and had his slides were just, I mean, for those of you that did not register, please register just so you could look at the slides because it just it, it just had a ton of great information. 
Um, our next session was Tony Payan. He was with the Baker Institute's Center for the United States and Mexico. And he co-presented with David Gantz, Professor of Law Emeritus at the University of Arizona. Um, unfortunately, David didn't get a lot of time to, to, talk, to talk. It was you know, kind of up against the clock there, but they had some really good points to talk about you know, when it comes to trade and import export. And um, you know, one of the things they talked about was how Mexico is impacted more than the United States when it comes to imports. And that's because of the automotive industry, which I never in a million years would have ever thought of that. Um, and how Mexico just overall has been impacted because they don't have a lot of the same, um, I don't wanna call them luxuries because that's kind of the wrong word, but like they don't have things like unemployment. They don't have things like food stamps. They don't have those things like the protections in place that like Americans can take advantage to keep you know a roof over their head. As much government assistance. Exactly, thank you. That's a better way to put it. So I don't know. I, what that has to do with the supply chain, I have no idea, but it just, I just thought it was interesting. <laughs> I guess when you think about it, it's because their workers aren't being protected and that is such a big part of the supply chain. Is That's the true. Moving. And That's so if true. like your entire, comp your entire warehouse gets sick, then nothing's getting sent out. Yeah. That's a good point. And that's, I think, what he was talking about with the imports and stuff. You know, I don't know. He also said that, um, and I can't remember if it was, it was David or Tony, but I think it was David. He said that the United States is going to become less dependent on other countries when it comes to importing pharmaceuticals from foreign suppliers. So I, I have no idea what that number looks like, how much we import from foreign suppliers when it comes to pharmaceuticals. Um, if anybody is listening and would love to educate us on a future Link Live, I'm all ears because I, I don't know why I found that so fascinating, but um, I would be kind of curious to know what that number is because to, to reduce that, especially now in a time when we're trying to find a vaccine. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't know, I just thought it was super interesting. So. Right. Um, and then they did touch on the USMCA. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have it right. It's for agreement, so I didn't. I don't know how to say that, but they did touch on it, and they said that Mexico is going to be the place to be in the coming yes. years. Of what did they say? They they just said it was going to be the place to be. Well, I think they said in terms of foreign communications, um, it's a better alternative for manufacturing in comparison to other countries. Right, and that is something that we have covered on SDCE mm -hmm. as well. And we, we really covered the USMCA deal last year when they first passed it and how big of a deal, what kind of impact that will have between the three countries. And so, if they predicted that the United States isn't going to be as reliant for pharmaceuticals, I wonder how that is going to impact both Canada and Mexico. Then. Yeah, it'll be very interesting. And I would be curious if somebody from, you know, who, who understands more of how the Canadian import export process works. I mean, I'd be willing to bring them on as well, because I mean, we should compare and contrast because a lot of you know, the U.S. companies would kind of wanted to know what their what their options are moving forward. Um, yeah, Canada has different rules and ways of doing things. And mm -hmm. when Canada shut down its borders, mm -hmm. the crisis that was one of the only things that they let through was that people could only come in if it was for trade. So, and I think they had a lot more strict, like they had stricter um, regulations put in place as well, like in terms of inspection and um, mm -hmm. that's from what I've read. But again, I haven't seen too much on it. So, um, well, I think Laura said last week in our link live that when you ship something overseas, it has to live up to the standards of that country as well as your country. So I think that's gonna also shift a whole bunch with COVID. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I really agree. Especially mm -hmm. since I feel like they're going to be raising the bar a little bit on some things, you know, just to kind of protect 
um, you know, because mm -hmm. most of Canada is still from what we learned from Brian. Brian's our, one of our sales reps who um, is based in Canada and they're still kind of shut down like to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, he still wears a hat in the meetings. So I have no idea what his hair looks like. <laughs> <laughs> he still has quarantine hair or not. <laughs> So we'll see. Um, so I don't know. I thought that was interesting. Um, in our last session, oh my God, this, th these guys were a hoot and a half. Um, Abe Eshkenazi, CEO of the Association for Supply Chain Management, who we've had on previous Link Lives um, discuss sustainability in the supply chain. And he was co-presenting with Dan Krieger from the Association of Climate Change Officers. And those two just had a lot of personality delivered to a conversation that can be somewhat sensitive for a lot of companies. Um, and that sustainability in the supply chain and why it's important even in a pandemic and why companies should put their money and their efforts and their people into building facets of a supply chain that are sustainable, whether it be the packaging, whether it be just how you do business. Um, and so I just, I don't know, I could listen to them speak all day because they were just that informative and, and they were funny. So, um, yeah, <laughs> and it's, I remember, I think it was like shortly after you started Marina, we were talking about sustainability and how we I think we just assumed that all companies have a sustainability plan in place or a green initiative plan right. in place. It's not true. Yeah. And, but it's such a, it's such a big deal as well. And I, you asked a question like yesterday during the session, and I think it was just simply like, why should companies care about right. sustainability? And you said, it's just good business. Mm -hmm. It's just a good way of doing business. And mm -hmm. a lot of, which is something that you brought up in the chat is, you know, how, you know, it is a lot of the younger generation, but it is leaking into the older generation. You know, we want to support companies that also do good business and, 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 and um, follow sustainable initiatives and efforts. And so we will buy products from companies that I guess match what our viewpoint is in terms of a sustainable company. So I think what's something that Dan said, he said companies plan for just in time, but they don't really plan for just in case. So yes, I yeah, wrote that down too. It was such a good quote because it was like, wow, you're absolutely right. Being like you said earlier, more proactive about things and sustainability, you know, has mm -hmm. to be part of that equation. Right. We have to, we have to care about the environment. I don't think that is a political stance right. to ever say right. that. We have to care about it because it is 106 degrees in Wisconsin. It hasn't rained here in days. But uh, he also said sustainable supply chains are more profitable and more resilient at the end of the day. Sorry. Yes. And I, I really agree with that. And then something just circling back to the comment about how the younger generation and now it's leaking to the older generation to buy from companies that have similar values to them. Companies can also risk cancel culture if they don't step up as well and because social media is a very powerful tool and these younger kids these teenagers they're ruthless oh i know <laughs> they are ruthless and i think they are holding companies into such higher standards now because they want to create a generation that is safe for them. And if they, and if companies aren't going to step up and have a sustainability practice in place or just like make, have a stance against social justice issues that are happening today, that was discussed a lot mm -hmm. during the sessions is that we are currently in two big health crises. There is a health crisis with the coronavirus and then there is a health crisis with the racism racism that is still going on in our country and that is something that needs to be addressed and that's something that companies need to address as well or else they will risk running out of business because the teens are ruthless when it comes to social media they will put you on blast 
and some of their moms too, depending on which mom's Facebook group you're on. <laughs> <laughs> I just see that on my end, like, no, my kids are not doing e-learning. No, why they need to go to school. I know. Um, but, but that's just a good way to look at it too. Like if you can't improve for yourself, at least improve it for the next generation. Because right. that's what you want. Exactly. And you have to want, you want to pass that on to your kids so that they see why things are important. You know, not just teach them this is important. This is why it's important. And I know that that was some of the things they talked about is the why of everything. Um, you know, mm-hmm. the if, the if then, if then, if this happens, then this will happen um, kind of planning. And, and they also provided some great um, examples of companies that, you know, didn't address sustainability in, a, in the correct way, meaning in terms of they received a little bit of social media backlash and they didn't really handle it appropriately. And then some other companies um, that handled it just right and, and made good on their promise to, to be better. And yeah. I think that's important. So for those that didn't register that would like to learn more on that, um, make sure you get onto foodlogistics.com and sdcexec.com because we're gonna have the on-demand version up within the next 24, 48 hours. And um, I just was blown away by this stuff. I learned so much and you know, we're in this industry and I've been in it for quite some time. And we deal with so many people with case studies and articles and interviews and podcasts. And I just, I don't know, like the stuff, there's something to be said for the face to face to face via Zoom when you're learning this kind of stuff because they talk about things that you can't, it's hard to read on paper and really understand it. And I just, I don't know, my, my big takeaway from the SCN Summit is that's the part of it I like. I like the visual, I like the interaction, I like that it's live. Um, and I like that the speakers are very engaging, so. I agree. I that's that also was- just something I like about this too, as well. You're always learning. And Daniel Stanton says that in almost every single one of his LinkedIn posts. Yeah, to, that's true. To, he does. To always, to always be learning and that, and that it's very, very important, especially with an industry that is constantly changing and improving. Yeah. yeah. And it's, and that's a good point to say. I mean, it's, it's, it is changing. It is improving. Everybody that's in it wants to be in it and wants to do right. Whether it's you know from a professional development standpoint, whether it's from a software development point, whether it's from just moving product through the chain, everybody's in it because they want to be in it. And I think that's something that's always drawn me to this industry. I mean, I've worked in food, you know, pretty much my entire journalism career. But you know, I've worked on food in terms of the finished product side, and I was always like, woohoo! I get to go to food shows and candy shows and bakery shows, and that's fun and all. But I, I don't know. There's something we said about the supply chain people. They're just they just have the passion that they just literally leave on the table for you to just, it's so infectious. So um, I don't know. So thank you to all of our speakers yesterday. Thank you to all of our speakers coming up because we still have five more sessions. Did I count that correctly? Yes. Um, So I'm very, very excited. (laughs) Yay. So thank you to everybody that was a part of yesterday's summit. Thank you to McKenna. Ambriel, who's on vacation, for helping me get this off the ground, for keeping <laughs> moving behind the scenes. Um, so for those watching, foodlogistics.com, sdcexact.com. McKenna, you can go over some of the awards we have open. So I know we have a couple of awards we, still open. We currently have the FL100 award that is for the top software and technology, food and beverage supply chain providers. And then for SCCE, we have the that's SCCE Green Awards, and that's all about sustainability. Woo-hoo! Very excited. And while you're on our website, please make sure you check out Link, our podcast channel. Make sure when you're on sdcexec.com, make sure you check out Link Educate that um, goes online every Thursday. That's our professional development series. Um, Link is every Tuesday. Um, we're in the process of closing out our August issue. We're already in September. We've already started planning for October. We have great, great, great stuff coming up for 2021 in terms of topics, in terms of people we want to connect with. So if you want to connect with us, you know how to find us. Um, we are on Facebook, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, all of the social media pro- platforms. So please like, comment, subscribe, and follow us. 
That would make me very happy. <laughs> We're not on MySpace. <laughs> no, unfortunately. <laughs> Is that even still around? Justin Timberlake tried to buy it oh. a few years ago and tried to make it research, but I don't think anything came of it. Oh, well. A bad spin off. <laughs> what can you do? That's from my generation. <laughs> oh, well, what can you do? Um, so thank you everybody for being a part of our family today and being a part of our discussion and um, continuing to support us. Uh, foodlogistics.com, sccexec.com. This is Facebook Live, Link Live. <laughs> <laughs> we will see you next Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central. Thank you. Bye. Bye.